Welcome. Thank you, everyone who's joining our second roundtable discussion. Um, we love doing these critical conversations on critical infrastructure. Apparently, you guys do too, so we're going to continue, not our last one. Um, as sort of some context setting, because there probably might be some new folks. Hey, Tiffany, I see you. Um, this, this thing that we're doing and what we're doing with Network VIP is really all around facilitating connections between pros and IT. This is a tough industry, guys. Um, and, and the more that we can start dialogue and conversations and help you guys trade notes on what's important and what makes you better at your jobs. And, and to Russ's point, I don't know if we were saying this before we hit live or after, um, the stuff that gives you leverage in your careers and helps you make more impact in your organizations, um, that's why we're doing this. And so to that end, today's discussion that we picked out, which uh, we hear a lot about, is all about DDI and, and whether, I mean, I'm a new homeowner, so I, I, I've got DIY on the brain, I'll be honest. Thank you. Um, but should you DIY your DDI or, or, or should you have an enterprise solution? And so probably the truth is somewhere in between, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we've got folks that I consider friends in the industry joining us. So this is fantastic. And we'll introduce themselves in a minute. Um, my name is Dana. For context, I run our corporate communications program here at Blue Cat, but this is not a Blue Cat discussion whatsoever. Uh, this is really all about open industry. And, and a couple housekeeping points before we kick off. So one, um, the best way to enjoy this is probably in speaker view, which is in your top right hand corner. I'm just reading off some notes here. The uh, Slack Zoom, uh, sorry, the Zoom chat, you can use it, but Christian and Truman from our community team are actually going to be doing some polling in the general channel. Hey, Christian. Um, they're going to be doing some polling in the general channel, so keep an eye on that. You're going to be able to hello. input as well. Hello, hello. I will mute you, though, because uh, that might be a little I bit distracting. Thank you, Isabel. Um, the, the next point is... Um, we got to give a hat tip to a couple of really awesome Network VIP community members. Um, usually we like to do this in the form of karma points uh, that, that essentially assign some, some awesome points to people who commit awesome feats of community. And Josh Youssef and Josh Morris, uh, we would like to award you 25 karma points. We never give out that much. We usually give out one to five numbers or like one to five uh, karma points. This is because after the last conversation that we had, after the last round table, you guys started some really uh, thoughtful discussions to continue it and add your thoughts and, and ask others for theirs. And we think that's really important. So I think your number is 15 and 21 on the Karma Point leaderboard now. I think Christian's gonna post that, which is, I mean, that, that that's a pretty good jump out of a community of about 500 people. So the last piece I'm going to say is, uh, is enjoy the show. I'm going to pass it off to Andrew, uh, our host today and moderator. Thank you, Dana. So welcome everybody. And as Dana said, um, yeah, th this is the, the point of this conversation is to, is to have an interesting conversation for the community. And so as anybody participating or anybody in the community has other topics that you think we should do with the round table, please share. We're looking for your input. We want, we want the community to drive these as well. Um, and to make sure that we hit the types of topics that are, are interesting to everybody. So anyway, Andrew Wordkin, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here at Blue Cat, um, which means I'm focused on our go forward strategy across a couple of different pillars, but mostly it means I work with uh, a large group of our customers, which is really where we uh, understand the industry and understand where customers are investing so that we can make sure our products are are focused on that. And, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we generate a lot of rich conversations, which is what I like to do. So basically, I'm the chief talker here at Blue Cat. So, um, but I want to give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves, uh, maybe starting with uh, Russ. Okay, Russ White, um, Juniper Networks, infrastructure architect, been doing this for about 30-ish years. Um, that's all I'm going to say. If you want to find me, you'll find me. <laughs> Russ has a very, very interesting blog called Rule 11, which I suggest. Uh, Frank? Uh, Frank Seesink. I'm actually a senior network engineer at UNC Chapel Hill, but I do not represent them. I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I've only been there for a year and a half. I spent 20 years before that at a state uh, research and education network in another state. Um, 
and I've been doing this for quite some time. So, welcome, Frank. And Sai. Uh, I'm Sai, and I'm uh, working for. I've worked for various Silicon Valley companies like Google, Dropbox. Uh, currently consulting for Robinhood, uh, but basically my history goes back 10, 20 years in infrastructure. Robin Hood DNS, Robin Hood DNS. Where have I heard those two things recently? Um, welcome, Sai and Ryan. Hi, I'm Ryan Patterson, and I work for Uber Technologies. Um, I am a systems engineer, and I am the owner of our corporate DDI stack. So anything DDI related, uh, that's I'm the guy to go to. Super, welcome. Thank you all. So let's get started with with just sort of a basic um, question to to sort of ground everybody. So what sort of DDI or DNS setups have you seen throughout your careers? All of you have been doing this for quite some period of time. Um, and maybe we'll sort of go around the table with this one and then and then try to drive some discussion after that. So why don't we do it in reverse order of introduction? So Ryan? Yeah, so I started my job as a consultant. Um, I originally worked as Geek Squad or for Geek Squad. And then I thought, hey, I could do this on my own and I can get paid a lot more to do it. So I, may, I helped the, um, a bunch of small businesses here in Silicon Valley get off the ground. So I've seen the simplest DDI stack of just a router uh, in, their, in their office. And then as I've worked my way up, um, I've seen everything from hub and spoke models. And then I'm currently focusing on getting to a uh, data center centric model. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm looking at right now. Did you get to drive the Geek Squad car around? I did, and uh, <laughs> so yeah, I had the full suit and the, the white shirt and the badge and everything. It was, it was right. a fun time. Right. I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, maybe you can go visit my mom after this. Um, and uh, uh, Frank? Oh, uh, okay, well, I can actually go back to before DDI was DDI. Uh, I can remember putting together networks where that wasn't even a thing. But I've dealt with everything from really doing static configurations with Etsy host files uh, through Bind, where I worked previously at the state r &E network. For the longest time, we ran Bind on a VAX VMS system uh, managed by two guys. That's a long story in itself, but um, eventually using InfoBlox. So, but I've seen the full range, everything from, and, and when we're talking DDI, of course, we want to make it clear for those who aren't, we tend to focus on one or two of those things, right? I mean, but we have to remember it's DNS, DHCP, and IP address management. Being on the network side, I focus mostly on the IP address management side at my previous job. That's how I was able to, um, I call it a Skunk Works project. I brought in a product, it wasn't Blue Cat, it was Infoblox, but I was able to swing it in that way and then eventually uh, expand that to the group that was responsible for DNS and DHCP and roll it out that way. But um, but I have seen the, the gamut from nothing to people doing IP address management with Excel spreadsheets and text files. I mean, Excel is the most abused tool on the planet, but um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you name it, I've probably seen it at some point. So, and for DHCP, everything from a Linksys to, you know, you doing it with a Cisco router to doing proper things using a tool like an Infobox, so. Yeah, you know, it, it it's it's interesting. I mean, this in this, world of DDI where these things go together and there's value in these things going together. Um, obviously, there's lots of companies that still manage these separately, but but you make a point that that we see over and over again, and that is, you know, the network team usually by default owns IPAM and usually DHCP too. DNS has got a lot of stakeholders mm -hmm. pulling at it as it sort of sits between that network and application layers, and, and there's sort of different use cases based on the stakeholder or you know, it's the Microsoft guys or whatever the case might be. And maybe we'll get into that a bit as well. Uh, that, si? that was actually the, the big difference for where I used to work. In networking, we did the, the IP address management and the DHCP. DNS was handled by a group referred to as systems. So it'd be like right. the guys who did the servers. And predominantly it was like, there's the guys who do the boxes and the guys who do the wires. But right. DNS, for some reason, they, their argument was, well, it belongs in our group because DNS runs on a box. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we're like, uh, yeah, but we need it for the wires. You know, it's like, it, so yes, but that's that's a very common. Do you think that uh, that bind software is still running on that VAX, wherever that VAX might be? Uh, no, the VAX is finally gone, but it was actually decommissioned a lot more recently than I'd like to admit to. Um, right. But I, I was not, you know, responsible for that. But um, right. but to, but to the credit of the guys who ran it, they did a phenomenal job. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things worked forever. All right, Sai. Yeah, so I think I'll take this approach from a more of a continuum basis from a company life cycle. So I think most. People start when they when they start with a startup, 
like you know 10 20 people it's going to be uh, airport express or linksys whatever they have running at home running dhcp dns no, they're not going to use public DNS. If they have public DNS, they're going to be doing it from RA53 or something. And then as the company grows, then then maybe they hire their first guy to do something and run help desk at the same time. And then and then that person might might run something on Windows. And then as the company gets bigger and management gets more out of hand, that's when they start bringing in the rail infrastructure people and they go, do we want to run InfoBloss or do you want to do ISC? you know, Kia, all that fun stuff. So I think, I think you know, having been in the industry long enough, that's, I see it more as a continuum, more than more than a company deciding to do one thing or the other right from the bat, because most of the time, the founders of a company rarely think about this style of things. <laughs> so they just do whatever. And then it's not until they get to the point where we need to hire someone to manage this that any thought is put into any of this. Yeah, or, so, something, or, or something breaks or, yeah, I mean, right. you, know, you get to, right. get, and, and that's why th this market in general, you know, um, certainly doesn't service usually, you know, early startups with 10 or 15 employees. There's, there's you know, you, you just look at cost and value and I think it, it's with, you know, less, way less complexity then the value is not there for cost. But sure, it definitely spectrum. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And, and Russ? So I would say uh, when I first got into this, we were using host.c files, things like that. And then we had a bunch of Novell Netware where we threw DHCP and DNS at the Novell servers <laughs> and let them do it. And uh, Microsoft servers as well, we used to do that. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, everything from very customized stacks. Uh, in fact, I have a couple of patents in the DNS area because of some stuff I was doing at LinkedIn. And then there is... Uh, the cool stuff that went on behind the scenes at VeriSign and VeriSign Labs on the other side of the DNS stack. Right. Um, so that entire range, everything in there. And I think I agree with Sai. A lot of times you just start out with whatever's there and then you just, people build on it over time and they don't really think about it until it becomes a problem most of the time. Right. Yeah. It, it becomes a, it becomes a, pro yeah, right. it either becomes a problem because of, I don't know, you know, stability, ability to change, or it becomes a problem because of compliance or governance. Um, how do we, um, you know, wh where do you think that crossover point is? Like, wh when when do you think DDI becomes a thing in that spectrum? A um, anybody? Yeah, my my initial sense is is that in a data center, it becomes a thing when it's when it impacts performance of applications. In the real, in the rest of the real world, it becomes a becomes a thing when it doesn't work anymore and somebody's got to go fix it and it has to be fixed enough that it's a problem. Agreed. When people start talking about DDI is when you need to start thinking about DDI because you just <laughs> deploy something quick. You don't have to worry about it. But then if that problem just keeps occurring, then all of a sudden you need to build out a solution for it. Right. Yeah. If, if people broadly know what vendor a company is using inside their company, then probably they've been having problems with that vendor, you know? Uh, but yeah, I, th I think that, I think that's right. Now generally, I'll say um, f from a from a user perspective, user being employees of the company, usually about 500 people is 500 to 1,000 people is usually when uh, that slash 24 just doesn't cut it anymore. <laughs> that they that they use default out of the box from airport from Apple Airport or Linksys or whatever. Yeah, and that's that's when they probably start hiring a third party consultant to come in and, and bring in some heavier gear. Like that's when you probably start seeing your first Cisco's and stuff. And then they might start running it on those equipment or, or that might be the time when the consultant might also bring in like a DDI solution for them so that, you know, ideally it becomes a less scale. It, it, it's, it, it's all based on how much they want to spend on it, I guess. And then yeah. that, that's when the point of, do you hire somebody for this or do you pay somebody to do this one time because you only need to do it one time? Right. You know, I, uh, from, I, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, from a data center point of view, I, I actually see this a lot less nowadays because of so much cloud usage. <laughs> so, so data center has become less of a, and I guess it depends on whether you are a, a cloud first company or, or, or whether you're coming from a legacy company where data centers are, are still on trend. Or, are still or you're a single application hyperscaler like LinkedIn or Uber or somebody right. like that. Right, then DNS, right, that's then true. DNS, you've got to manage your own stack because otherwise, yeah. or you should. That's correct. Because your application performance relies on it, like you know. Right, and and I think um, 
as anybody who's who's operated or been in this business knows, you know, uh, debugging application performance or network performance or anything when when at the end it's a DNS issue, usually, you know, the amount of time it takes to get to that conclusion is usually too long uh, without the proper instrumentation and everything else. It becomes a complicated thing to to sort of understand and debug in many cases. There's also like, you know, we talked about data center or cloud. I think a lot, you know, from a from a broad networking standpoint, a lot of vendors have uh, segmented solutions. These are our campus and you know branch or robo solutions versus our data center solutions versus our cloud solutions. They sort of segment the world in these different areas because the requirements are very different. Um, most of the DDI vendors don't necessarily do that, but but by and large, you know, obviously there's a different set of requirements in user-focused networks versus infrastructure-focused networks. Um, and uh, and I think, at least from, from my perspective, I see companies oftentimes, even today, if they've bought into a DDI strategy, still sort of think of those as logically different areas of the network that they might actually service with different, different strategies. Is that something that resonates? Yeah, typically the production team versus the corporate team are, are, is a real thing. Right. And, an and never the twain yeah. shall meet usually. <laughs> they, yeah. they share very little in mission and they share very little in infrastructure. Well, maybe not very little, but but they, they might share a lot of the same infrastructure, but they definitely have different missions to accomplish. And, and usually what you hear is the production team doesn't want the corporate team messing up their side of the fence. <laughs> share conditional forwarders. We just basically send traffic to each other and we, we just manage our own stacks, yep. just for us. Right, right. You know, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's uh, the, the interesting perspective there is, you know, obviously, um, you know, there's, there's interoperability at the protocol level for a lot of this stuff. So, you know, as long as you've got those shared forwarders or whatever the setup might be, it's not like you can't interoperate DNS between, you know, DNS is built obviously to, to interoperate. So you've got that basic interoperability. The, the question though ends up being, or oftentimes there's a lot of frustration in trying to figure out why something's not working, whether it's an application mm -hmm. performance issue or an availability issue or something else. If the resolution path of a query that's still staying inside the company is hopping across different systems, you know, where where is this problem? It just adds more complexity to it. So I, I still, e even across corporate and production, I think I, I see a I see a, a mix out there in the general customer base. Because I think it comes down to that, you know. Um, so, uh, you know. Is it ever true that somebody gets into running their own DNS um, or even whether it's do-it-yourself do or whether it's a, a something they're running internally because of security? Because I know that when I was working at VeriSign, this was a huge deal. The amount of information you could see at the root servers was incredible. Right. Oh, absolutely. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, oh, I think that's why there's QName minimization and some other things out there to reduce the amount you can see at the root server. Right, right. Um, and to some extent, you know, um, some level of, of anonymization, at least of where that's coming from through, um, through open resolvers, whether they're DOH or otherwise. but for sure. Uh, but what do you mean by because of that? In other words, you know, at the end of the day, you're still hitting the root servers if you're going to the internet. So the yeah, but even but even running your own recursives versus outsourcing your recursives, if ah, you're outsourcing yeah. your recursives, you're leaking a lot more information, you're opening yourself to right. exfiltration through the query process. Whereas if you're running your own recursives in house, even if it's a commercial product, you're running in house, right? Um, you have a lot more control over what's going on there. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else has a comment on that. Would you, just from just from, you know, Russ from from just sort of my view of of Blue Cat customers, I think um, I think the majority, but maybe a slight majority, maybe it's sixty forty, are running their own recursors versus going to some, you know, third party resolver. Whether they're paying for that or they're just more comfortable using an open resolver uh, than than running their own. Um, although it's, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, fairly straightforward to run your own if it's a commercial product. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, I, the, the, I don't know, you know, beyond just DDI, the general idea of, um, how much, 
how much infrastructure you can DIY and do yourself versus, you know, when you need to hit some uh, or use some commercial product when that makes sense. I think, uh, I, I, you know, that point we talked about, whether it's cost, whether it's uh, application performance or any of those things, sometimes the, the, the DIY view becomes, you know, add some level of complexity because what was some simple, straightforward thing to begin with turned into um, multiple people over multiple years, f servers running that nobody knows exist. You know, we, we've seen we've seen some some pretty special deployment architectures from a DNS perspective that just sort of, you know, were crowdsourced almost internally over the years. So I, I don't know if if you know DIY could be the strategy in some case. And in other cases, it's just what's always been there, which oftentimes leads to cobwebs. And, and I guess my point is that, um, uh, you know, that, which you can do with a commercial system, by the way, you can mismanage it and turn it into a complex nightmare as well. I, I, I think I, the argument I don't want to make is that you couldn't do this stuff with DIY, because of, of course you can. I think the question just comes into how much of your own um, how much of that cost you're absorbing versus utilizing a vendor to to absorb it. And I don't know if that's something that's, you know, measured. I don't know if, if anybody on the panel has sort of been through that process of going from DIY to commercial and thought through, like, um, you know, what, how that was justified internally. Um. I could probably speak to that one because where we were before, like I said, we, we ran bind. Um, now I was not responsible for that, but I worked in a place that to, to put it simply, it's one of the poorest states in the country. So operationally speaking, cost was everything as in absolute dollars. So, you know, I, I used to always joke that I could do anything I wanted as long as it didn't cost any actual money. Now that meant burying things like, you know, I could spin up VMs and, and get the systems guys to give me stuff. And that costs stuff, but they're not seeing that because it's not in dollars. Um, so for a while, running things like Bind, running Microsoft Active Directory, doing whatever internally, it, it makes sense to a point. But even in where I was working at, which never had a staff even hitting 100 people, right? Uh, the, we averaged around 60 to 70, give or take, uh, for most years if you average it out. Um, we had two people, just two people, who understood that system. One of them ended up dying. The other one's actually still there. But... Um, you know, you, you, you also have to worry about your, your vulnerability as an, as an entity, right? Because if you only have one person who understands that, that wonderful artisanal setup of yours, uh, you're in trouble if that person leaves or tires, gets hit by a bus, or, or the expression I heard from a, a Verizon guy, which lived with us for years, was if you're one of the milk truck guys, which basically meant if you got hit by a milk truck, your organization was screwed. Um, so for us, and this goes back almost 15 years, we were evaluating it. Internally, I, me, I, I, I saw a lot of issues with the way this was being done. We were managing IP addresses in a spreadsheet that I referred to as the spreadsheet from hell. Um, and that lasted way longer than it should have. Uh, it's also an unscalable solution from the IP address management side, right? Because if you're using a spreadsheet, even if you put it on a network share, only one person can edit it at a time. It's a nightmare. Um, you add in DNS to it. You know, how, how are we going to manage this? Well, we got to ask that one of those two guys to go do it for us. That's not scalable. That doesn't work real well. And if you're in the network side, depending on the project you do, you, there's times when you need to spin up uh, DNS entries real quick anyway. Having something like a Blue Cat or an Infoblox, an appliance, some, some package deal that handles all three of those, you have the capacity much more quickly to bring people into it. So in the end, uh, the end result of, of going to that was we suddenly had half a dozen, almost 10 people that could easily go in and make changes as needed. The really nice part is you have accountability because you have audit trails for every every change that's made. So if somebody complains that their website disappeared, you can find out who, who made that change, right? Which in most of those systems like Bind, good luck. Um, and the cost of it, you know, cost is, is a very amorphous term. For some people, cost is money. Uh, for other places, it's manpower. You know, do you have the skill set? I also was in a state where finding enough qualified, competent people. Now, some people live in California. Some people live like I'm here in North Carolina. There's some really nice areas where you got a lot of tech folks, but there's also some major parts of the country where they're struggling to have enough tech talent to be able to do fundamental things and then try to recruit somebody to one of those states where they don't pay well, 
And you, you have to have another reason to be there. I mean, sadly, a lot of people that work there were there because they have family or they grew up there. And that's not good or bad. It just is. And so your, your evaluation of, you know, what does it cost? For us, even in an organization that small, in the end, it was far better to not do the DIY because it gave us more flexibility. Also, it offloaded certain workloads. Um, and I have to say, in the long run, it saved a lot more money, but it's hidden money. So you have to be smart enough to, as I used to say about my boss, one of the reasons I took that previous job was he saw numbers behind the numbers, right? Most people look at an item and say, I'm going to pay this much upfront. This is what it costs me. But they're not paying attention to, yeah, but you buy, for example, a blue cat, you buy an Infobox, you buy, you, you get five of them, you set them up in a grid, as, as Infobox calls it, I'm not sure what blue cat's term for it is. Um, and you start looking at how much time you save, manpower you save, man hours, um, that adds up significantly, but you have to see that. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, uh, companies and organizations, they don't, they look at absolute dollars and that's all that matters. And like I said, I had to struggle through that. As long as I didn't spend money, I could do all kinds of stuff. And I got very creative. I got very good. Now I'm almost on the other side. I'm not working for an Uber. I'm not working for a place that has a, a huge budget. But I am working from my perspective in an organization that actually has. We have a DDI architect. That's his title. That's his role, which shows you the emphasis they put on it. Um, so they value that, right? And that, that, that matters to me. That's why if you, you look at my career, I don't have a lot of job ops. But when I go... I go to places that are smart enough to realize true value. And that's not an easy calculation all the time. So yeah, sorry, no, I, didn't mean I, to... I think, right. And I think um, it, sort of going back to uh, our previous roundtable as well, I mean, there's the there's the OPEX side of, okay, we, we I can do this with less manpower or, you know, I can, so, so, so great. And, and I've reduced that op, operational cost. The, the, the flip side too, where certainly we see issues around, uh, homegrown solutions that weren't built for this is, you know, now I've got, I can't possibly sustain the number of changes required in the environment anymore if I've got smart hands on keyboards to make those changes. So how can I drive automation? And that just brings up, you know, yet another level of investment potentially with a, with a you know, homegrown system that, you know, that doesn't allow me to do that. But, um, you know, so there's the cost side. I think there's also a couple of other uh, other angles as well, certainly that we see, um, whether it, it's around the security side, and, and, and I just mean uh, the vulnerability of the service itself. It, th these are critical services; they've got to be up, or you know, portions of the business are down. And so there's a there's a risk mitigation side to it as well. I think that's that's you know somewhat critical. Having a vendor there um, to support and help if there are any issues, you know, and so that supportability side as well. I, th I think rolls into it too. Um, Ryan, m maybe you can you can um, give us a couple of the, you know, you're working for a company that that is transitioning into a commercial DDI system as we speak. Um, oh, we actually just wrapped it up last week, so we are uh, we're on Blue Cat now. Uh, right. That's one of our big big accomplishments. Thanks to COVID, we were able to migrate all of our offices with very little impact. So that was a, a good thing for us. Um, but yeah, so for us, there was a lot of things that we had to address when it comes to this migration. Um, one of them we had not just a DDI stack, it was all windows or all whatever it was, it was split. So if we wanted to do automation, we would have to write code that pointed to solar winds and then windows DHCP and windows DNS. And that would have to target a variety of different servers and in different parts of our infrastructure. You know, we have over 200 different offices and multiple data centers. So creating a solution that was on these different services was really hard for us. So that's one of the reasons why we made the migration. It's the time and effort that we'd have to learn variety of different APIs for different systems, pull it all together. And then the um, just the ease of automation. We, we, we know we're gonna be spending engineering hours, we're gonna be spending time to build all this stuff. We wanna create the least amount of code as possible because the more code you create, you're kind of creating tech debt as you go. Right. Um, so and you have to maintain that code for a long period of time. So we need to have something that is um, very streamlined, very easy to use and very flexible for the different systems. So that's uh, one of the reasons why we ended up making the transition to BlueCat because the time and effort we would have to put in to create our own DDI solution just to meet the features of what BlueCat provided um, well, well, well out cost the, the time of doing it ourselves. Right. It, it's, at some point, it doesn't become worth it from an intellectual property standpoint either. It's not, I don't think Uber's in the business of DDI. So, so there, <laughs> you know, so at, at some point, it's just not where you want to spend your dollars. Um, 
you know, uh, so, but, but good and congratulations again. Um, yeah, no, because a lot of people think of Uber as, a, and this sort of harkens back to what I was talking about before in terms of, you know, what's happening at the offices as well. Um, you think of Uber and you think of born in the cloud, um, you know, uh, and um, and so, you know, maybe maybe to size point before, then, well, if you're born in the cloud, why aren't you just using cloud native services for all this stuff? You know, uh, and that's not necessarily DIY, but it would be a DIY DDI because you'd still be using separate services. But, um, uh, you know, it, I, I think, I think, and don't let me put words in your mouth, what you just said is, you know, it's also integrating and making sure there's integration across all the offices as well. Yeah, we're not necessarily have our all of our, our stuff in our own data centers. We do use cloud solutions as well. Um, and I think one of the biggest problems that we're encountering right now is AWS really hamstrings what you can do in terms of DHCP and DNS within their infrastructure. So we're having to create workarounds because we're using the cloud solutions. So we have to go above and beyond and, and commit this time uh, to make AWS work with our BlueCat environment. Right. Right, good. Yeah, no, and I think that, that brings up another point, which is... Uh, you know, I don't know any commercial DDI customer, whether it's us or Infoblox or anybody else out there, where there isn't some part of the organization that's still using something else. And it might be a different commercial solution. It might be, you know, I don't know, top of the rack switch DHCP. I mean, there's there there's other things that they're being they're being used, and and I don't think the commercial DDI vendors can assume they'll have a hundred percent penetration because there's, you know, it, it's uh, products are fit for requirements. And if the products, if, if there's better ways to meet those requirements, then then people will meet them in a better way, you know? And, and so I, I think there's usually a mixture anyway. It's so good. I, is there, is there um, you know, uh, this this topic, you as we've been talking about DDI, but this topic you can, you can roll across anything, right? Um, you know, Russ, Russ, I know is a big committer on free range routing and, and you know it ends up you can create a pretty featureful router with a Linux box and and uh, an FRR, and you know and and many people do that. And so you, my point and Russ, maybe you want to comment there. I mean, there's, you know, it goes across obviously anything in infrastructure. You could roll your own or you can buy something. Yeah, yeah. It always comes down to what are the trade offs. What I always say is, if you haven't found the trade offs, you haven't looked hard enough. So there's, there's always the trade-offs and you just got to decide what are you gaining versus what are you losing? Um, and so for me, like for DDI, a lot of it's going to come down to, again, what your, what your telemetry look like, what your performance look like internally versus externally. Uh, do you want to push everything to a cloud-based service? Do you want to run a commercial service versus running bind or something that you've rolled yourself? All of these come into just what are the trade-offs? Um, and where are you paying for it, basically, in the end? What Frank was saying about being able to get good people. It's really hard to find good DNS people, in my opinion. So I think that plays a big role into it. Yeah, there. Uh, it, it's a it's a bit of a cottage industry, isn't it, across um, across the globe? Um, and uh, you know, it, it's it's there's there's few experts, and there's a lot of people with their their hands in the pot. And you know, it, it gets to another topic that that you wrote about Russ and I, I slacked you about in your blog they really liked but th this whole idea of of um, of reducing complexity and and how to approach reducing complexity so that people that aren't necessarily experts can accomplish work and how to do that correctly versus versus uh, not correctly um, yeah. which I thought was quite insightful yeah so for me this this goes beyond just letting other people do work you really can't, you build a network that's too complex. There's um, the first correlative key law or the second correlative key law says that you can know your piece of the, of the system and one piece adjacent on either side of your piece. And beyond that, it's just rumor and pop psychology. And right. so I, th <laughs> I think this is an absolute truth that we forget is that the networking guys really just barely understand DNS and the DNS guys just barely understand the network. And the more complex you make those pieces, the less able people are to understand it and the less you can get your head around the whole system. And we don't take a systemic view of these things. We take a piece by piece view. It's my little, it's my little piece and my little piece alone. And 
that's all I really care about. And I think that's a really uh, major problem for us. Yeah. I, 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 sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that was like one of the main things that we focused on when we were moving over to Blue Cat is just simplifying everything. Things get so complex so fast without any of us meaning to. But with our migration, we sat down with all those teams around us that utilize the service and then asked them what their plus one was so that we made sure to accommodate the growth for a long period of time, but also making it as simple as possible. That's the end goal, right? You don't want to sit here and have this complex web. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's crucial. It's very important. And we forget simplicity. And it's so, so important. Um, we just pile stuff in until we're done. And then we end up five years from now looking back and going, how did that all work? I don't even know. We, we used to have a rule of thumb when I was in Cisco Tech. If, if it takes you longer, um, if, if you can't explain it in less than 15 minutes to someone who doesn't speak your native language at two o'clock in the morning, you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> you know, I, I think um, that, 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 uh, that idea of, of understanding your, your stakeholders, Ryan, is, is critical and what their expectations of the system is, as is thinking of this as a system. Um, you know, speaking as somebody who was trained in systems and, and constantly thinking of systems, um, you know, you, you can optimize, if you optimize your piece, let's say it's DDI in a silo, then, then you're, you're, you're not, you know, you're most likely going to fail the broader mission because, you know, you don't understand those connection points and you don't understand the way the system is working itself. And if you're not looking at solving those broader network requirements with the system, versus you know already choosing where you're going to solve them without thinking about the other components running in the system then again you're going to locally optimize something that isn't necessarily best for the system itself uh, it's really hard to to capture that you know we've all seen our gobs and gobs of enterprise architectures and network architectures and like you know if i have to open another visio in my life it's just you know that there's there's only so much of those you can look at and, and some people can just look at them and sort of matrix them and you know sort of understand how the stuff goes together but for most people it's it's rectangles and lines connecting stuff that doesn't necessarily document uh the system in such a way where somebody can understand the the flex points the the, the dependencies, the, you know, what, what portions of the system are responsible for what, you know, for instance, where commonization matters. Um, it, it's difficult to look at from a system standpoint uh, in many cases. I don't know if, if in, in, you know, in, in the DDI guys tend to concentrate on the DDI system, which is, again, one piece of that. Um, is, there some, is there some special way you guys have found to think of the network as a system um, so that you can um, individually understand or so you can understand optimization across the broader system? Um, for all of my tilting at this windmill, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I was lucky when we decided to go with Blue Cat because I got to rebuild our system from the ground up. Uh, we currently had a hub and spoke model in place. Uh, we had uh, DHCP and DNS servers in every single office. And it was, you know, deploying that many VMs, managing that many VMs across every single enterprise office, besides across every branch office and stuff like that in every data center. So coming in and approaching it from the ground up to the point where I'm touching IP helpers in every office and, and, and like working that entire solution before we even started doing the migrations. Um, I recommend everybody just taking a look at your infrastructure just from where the DHCP packet comes in and then just go step by step and understanding and seeing where you can make those simplifications. Uh, now we, with our you know current design, one of the cool things that we did is like any office can touch any DHCP server in our infrastructure. So we can encounter outages across multiple data centers and still be able to get on IPAM, move those DHCP servers somewhere else. And we can you know have one region hosting an entire different region at this point. So just by looking at each little component and understanding the service mm -hmm. itself, then you're providing a service to everybody else because they will never lose DHCP. They will never lose DNS as long as that office has an internet connection. It, being able to build something up gives you that advantage, but it, it sounds like you were looking at, you know, potential failure modes, which is a critical part of trying to build something that's resilient. How could this possibly fail? Um, but, but you know, would, would oftentimes that requires orchestration across the different silos as well, right? Um, I mean, you may or may not be updating IP helpers when and if that should happen. 
Definitely. Systems. And for us, you know, we, we have a system in our in our infrastructure called called a postmortem. I'm assuming most people know what a postmortem is. If something goes wrong, you have to write a report on why that went wrong. And um, we have to do that. The one thing that always sticks out to me is the five whys. So you have to basically continually ask why this happened. And then you have to ask why that happened. And instead of me doing a postmortem, I decided on every single point of our infrastructure to do a pre-mortem. Like what could go wrong here? Why, 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 why? And then I was able to re-architect our solution from the ground up to encounter, you know, get through as many of those whys as possible. I not necessarily can't get through all five, but I can at least get through three or four now in our infrastructure without having to even be woken up at two o'clock in the morning if something was to go wrong because we had enough resiliency built in uh, right. to not have to worry about that stuff anymore. Yeah, it's, it's a nice feeling to wake up in the morning and see that something happened in the evening and the system took care of it the way it was designed to take care of. Stuff's on fire, but everything's still working. Yeah. Right, right. All right, that's yeah. a good feeling. Um, again, things that can be done if you DIY, but but I think part of part of what you're saying is, you know, having that opportunity to re-architect something from the ground up allowed you to take the best practices for that component of this system, of the broader network system, DDI, um, and architect in such a way where you had, you know, pre-thought out potential failure modes and scale modes and resilience yeah. modes so that you can build something appropriately. And Going that's, that's one of Go ahead. Simplicity plays a big role there because if you can't get your head around the system, then you can't do that sort of, if this happens, will that happen type right. of a thing? It's impossible if you can't. Yep. No, agreed. Um, and and I, I think that's, I mean, th those are frankly part of the sort of conversations we want to drive in, in network VIP as well, because I think a lot of people, um, you know, as they try to think through what questions do I need to ask of this system in order to understand if these requirements are are actually met? You know, and and how can I how can I test for that? How can I simulate for that? You know, what's the best practices in this specific area? Um, you know, it, it's it's frankly something I was talking to Dana about earlier today, and, and something that we at at Blue Cat are trying to do a better job of, which is to inform and provide points of view in some of these cases that are, you know, more easily and readily available. Um, by our customers and the market in general, um, because they're, 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 it's never one size fit all. Everything w is within a context, right? Um, the way I did something might be different than the way Ryan did something because my context is different, my requirements are different, which is another piece of that, which I think a lot of you have mentioned in terms of, you know, when, when do I do this switch? Um, there, there's a, uh, you know, we've had some customers where this has just been, you know, um, the, the requirement in way they shifted had to do with the power of centralization, both from a we need to get stuff done quickly perspective, you know, like uh, we need to be able to, you know, today in order to when we create a new zone, you know, forwarders need to be updated on 150 Active Directory servers that are managed completely separately out there. The net effect of that is a reduction in the number of people actually touching it, which reduces OPEX. And years ago, Gartner had, when Gartner still covered this industry from like a magic quadrant perspective, they used to write that the driver to DDI was all about OPEX. We talked about other drivers earlier, like risk and, and performance, but and Sai, you mentioned maybe five or 500 or 1,000 employees or something. It, it's interesting, you know, I think it's, um, I don't necessarily think it's number of employees, although I would agree very few companies of 10 or 20 people, you know, I, I think it, it, it more has to do with, um, with those other broader requirements around how often, you know, how complex is my network or, you know, how often do these things need to change? Um, and we have- Right, employees is just a proxy for, yeah, for exactly. complexity. Right. right. So, right. To some extent. Right. I mean, th there's a there's a correlation there. Um, and, and if if you've got massive complexity with very few employees, you're probably doing something incredibly backwards. But um, but it makes it a little bit muddy there if we just look yeah. at it from an yeah. OPEX standpoint. I mean, some small networks I've worked on are extremely complex, like Telepost Greenland was very, very complex, even though there's only, you know, 10,000 people in Nook or whatever. Right. So complexity is not always correlated to the number of people, but it is a rough measure. It does turn in a lot of times. Right. Right. A lot of people think about it in terms of number of devices as well. And and I don't I don't know that that's the right measure either, because you know, yeah, the, the, the average employee now has 1.8 or 2.3 or whatever the latest math is, you know, connected devices as they walk into an office or get on a network. 
Um, but if those are standard user-driven devices, I, I, you know, certainly that adds to the number, it adds to the compliance problem, it adds to the tracking problem, um, but I don't know that devices alone uh, bring us over that sort of complexity point. I don't know if there's any thoughts on that. Well, I would agree with you. I think one of the things that it, it comes down to how much time is being invested into that network or that, that DDI solution, right? It's it, You could have one guy who's great at his job that's managing 50,000 users on a very simple infrastructure and maybe they don't need to DIY their DDI or you can have a very complex network who might have three or four people on a 500 person network and both of those things are completely different. Um, I think it comes down to where your money is going to keep that network up and running right. or that service, sorry. Right, no, for sure. Um, yeah, and, 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 uh, and, you know, we, we live in this world of, of critical infrastructure, which is always a bit of, a, um, you know, when, when it, 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 th there's this paradox, right? It's critical, it needs to be up. And there's an assumption that it, the best way to keep something reliable is to keep it somewhat static, yet the stuff needs to change all the time now. And, uh, and that creates a, a bit of a, I think a turn in this industry as well. Um, this stuff needs to change rapidly, yet I don't want it to break. And, uh, you know, some people are in the chat talking about um, a very good book, if you haven't read it, uh, around anti-fragile. But, you know, this whole idea that um, that a system, uh, an anti-fragile system gets stronger based on it being um, not injured, but, but, you know, based on forces. For, it doesn't just rebound to those forces. Uh, it gets stronger based on those forces. Um, you know, the way you build muscle weightlifting, for instance, you're actually injuring the muscle, but then the muscle comes back and gets stronger. Um, you know, and, and ultimately, um, you know, that idea is something that one, I think is fascinating, but but two is, is an area where I think that personally, that DDI vendors can do more to create additional value on top of something that is DIY, sort of pouring our intellectual property into creating those sorts of systems. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a, it, it sort of wanes in, from technology to philosophy to some extent, but um, you know, it, it, it's something we were actually playing around with from a, from a marketing term here. But uh, I, think, I think a bunch of, a bunch of, you know, a bunch of those that had input thought it was a bit too esoteric, but I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's a fit you know, fantastic way of looking at the way technology should work. With that, we've got about 10 minutes left and I did see some questions come in, at least one from John and one from Isabel. Um, do you guys want to take the mic? All you have to do is unmute yourself. Sure, I'll take a shot at it. So I, in characterization after after hearing the, the discussion here is, DIY really about integrated versus non-integrated more than anything, um, because you know in the context of what we call about integrated DDDI solutions, both Blue Cat as our sponsor today and almost all of the other major players, I mean they are leveraging bind, they are leveraging standardized DHCP services. The, the differentiator, right, is is they have an integrated management footprint. So, I, I can run DHC the the exact same DHCP service. I can run the exact same uh, bind service. I can run the I can run a spreadsheet. I can run a access database. I can do all sorts of different things. What I can't do readily, right, is have all of those things work together. So my question really is integrated versus non-integrated as, as the approach. Yeah. I think that's a, oh, go ahead, sir. Go, go for it. That is a huge component. I don't think it's the only component in it, but having the ability to make all of your management changes through a single interface is extremely helpful. A uh, single API solution as, as Blue Cap provides. You know, we do have integrated, you can have an IP management service with Windows full stack and only have like three server licenses, right? DNS, DHCP, or, and, and the IP management itself. Um, but it comes down, nobody's really using that in a large enterprise scale environment because of the limitations it provides. Um, it, it comes down to, for us, the decisions were, um, yes, the integration, but what, well, how much integration, what are the, the benefits of paying for this in a long-term situation versus us just using a free solution because we have a volume license with Microsoft? I, what I would say is, um, 
as far as integration, obviously that is a component because we're talking about DDI, right? We're talking about three different services. Um, but well beyond that, yes, you could do everything yourself. You could use NetBox for IP address management. You could use Bind or Core DNS. Um, side note, I, I read the release notes not long ago on Infoblox. They actually swapped out Bind for Core DNS uh, behind the scenes. Users have no idea. They don't care, right? Because that's one of the things. But I think that one of the biggest things, and I was going to say this earlier when Andrew was talking about it, um, one of the biggest things you get from these integrated services, if you, we can use that term, but it's a lot more than that. You have auditing, you have compliance, you have uh, things we not, haven't even touched on, like DNS firewalling, where you can actually analyze the traffic that's going through your DNS to see whether you've got exfiltration uh, tactics going on. You, know, you got hackers trying to move data out through your DNS queries. Um, and even beyond that is just the general concept, and I was having a conversation with my wife when I was w walking this morning about this, is you, you take any industry, um, how many people are really experts in that industry, right? Whether it's a mechanic, a plumber, it's any profession, honestly, it's across the board. But if you can get that knowledge, what are we doing in, in tech? For the most part, in, in a lot of arenas, we are finding those very highly specialized people and they are putting that knowledge into stuff, into a box, into an appliance, into software. Um, you can do it yourself, but are you that expert on all those pieces? Do you have that level? And I mean, I've seen the discussions back and forth, and, uh, and there is a time and a place for all of it, right? I mean, for the hyperscalers, for the, the Facebooks of the world, they don't necessarily need appliances. If they want to, they've got the skill set, they've got the manpower, and maybe for them, for the particular services they offer, they, they, they're better off because they want to tune it in a way that the appliances aren't built to do. But for a lot of folks, I mean, you know, do you build your own car? No, we go buy a car. Why? Because Honda makes thousands of them a day. You know, it's like you, you can... There's a there's a boundary point to it, but it's you know sometimes getting that box, paying that upfront cost. It, like I said, there's the hidden cost behind it, but there's also that expertise that's going into it. Um, putting that all together yourself is a lot more complicated than just integrating the three service demons, if you will. I mean, there, there's a lot more to it than that, and they're doing all that for you. I'm not saying that's always the answer. If I was a small company of 10, 20 people, there's there's a point at which you go, it's just not worth it buying an appliance. You just can't afford it. You might as well just run Windows for DNS and blah, blah, blah. Um, but once you get up into the large enough markets, um, any business of reasonable size, like I said, I worked at a place with less than 100 people. That cost, to me, the, the, the value of it was already there. And it was much more than just, hey, we get... DNS, DHCP, and IP address management in one appliance, and wow, that makes my life a little easier with a web browser. Um, and it's a lot of that, that that secret sauce that's melding it together. It's how Blue Cat does their distribution of stuff. It's how Infoblox does their distribution of firmware updates. It's how you can schedule things. I mean, we, ne we haven't touched on hundreds of elements of this that aren't even covered, that you would have to go and either use Ansible or SaltStack or think of all the other pieces you're going to have to bring into bear other than just the three services themselves. Um, I mean, like Infoblox, I can speak to that because I actually, I built the system at my previous job. I put it together, so I'm well acquainted with it. And I can speak to that one and say that updates, four steps. Log in, you hit one button to upload the code, you hit one button to, to distribute, to test the code, one to distribute, and the final one is you run it. You want to schedule that, you want to set it up that you're going to drop these appliances one at a time so that you're never out of your services, not a problem. All this is being offered through these package right. solutions, right. and there's value there. Which, which, just putting words in John's mouth, when when he said the integration, I, I think it was also the orchestration and upgrading. It was, it was that stuff. But just in in terms of time, I want to make sure Isabel has a chance to ask her a question as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Okay. Well, my question is more around um, the fact that when you actually implement a DDI solution, do you see a, a decrease in the team size or actual people operating that service or as opposed to an increase because now that you have actual visibility you can tweak and enhance as you go because it's just different way of operating so I, i'm going to say this comes back to the trade-off situation right and the expertise you have so this is why a lot of companies are using dent and sonic and stuff like that in their network operating systems which is funny how that term actually has shifted over the years. But anyway, so I think I think that if you're in a situation where performance matters, then you have to judge whether or not you need to bring those people on board in order to do that disaggregation and to actually do the um, do the tuning that needs to be done to make what you're doing done get get done what you need to get done. Um, 
Now, some people will do it just because they can, right? Which isn't always the right answer, but some companies will actually do it just because they can. We, we have, we're big enough, we can hire somebody. We're going to do it just because we can. Well, that's not really a good answer either. But it, it, it doesn't come down to whether the requirements have changed as part of implementing this. So if the point of implementing DDI is because there's too many hands in the pot because of all these disparate systems out there that need to be managed separately, but nothing else is going to change other than we're going to have a centralized system instead of having disparate systems where different people manage it, then then one one can assume you'll you'll reduce some of that headcount or at least have those other people doing things that are not DDI related. But if you're implementing this because the requirements have changed, for instance, you're starting to look at performance more holistically and therefore, you know, this becomes this becomes a surface that's going to be touched much more often, both from an analysis standpoint and a fine tuning standpoint. Well, now you not necessarily your goal isn't necessarily to reduce operational expense. Your your goal is to increase the performance of applications or reduce the amount of downtime or whatever the yeah. case might be. So yeah. in th th therefore, you have to, you know, you're not necessarily going to have that trade off. I don't know if that makes sense. Yep, I guess totally. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think and, I, and so it really comes down to why, you mm -hmm. know, w what what are the factors causing somebody to go by and uh, and and um, you know and then and then what are we going to do with the system? But uh, but look, most knowledge workers don't want to spend their time doing um, manual chores over and over and over again. That should be easily done. And so even if there's not a reduction in operational expense based on the number of people involved, um, hopefully you'll have, you know, skilled people doing more skilled work as opposed to, you know, at some point getting a remedy ticket and doing clerical work, which is, which is painful for most skilled people. Some might like it. Totally agree. The amount of time I've spent investigating weird DHCP issues in Singapore compared to uh, me actually working on engineering work is, is greatly swapped over since I don't have to focus on that stuff anymore. Right. Right, exactly. You're doing something that better utilizes your skills. It would be cool if you put on the Geek Squad outfit when you debug the DHCP stuff in Singapore. That's uh, far. That's gone. I don't know where that is anymore. <laughs> Not even a hat. <laughs> oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's awesome. Um, well, great. So we're at the top of the hour. Dana, were there any other other pressing questions? I just wanted to close off by one, just thanking our panelists. And two, um, if you guys can all just answer one last question, actually a couple things. One, if you still got questions, cause we only got to two, post them in the general channel in NVIP. Um, and two, I'd love to hear from the panelists, like where can we hear more from you? I don't know if you're on Twitter, if you're on LinkedIn, if you got a blog or an upcoming project. Um, and, and what's your final piece of advice out of this? And, and let me just say one thing before that which is, yeah, I'm sitting here watching the Network VIP general channel and there's like this whole other conversation going on germane to this conversation, but I think just that is valuable. So I would suggest those that aren't in Network VIP, not actually monitoring that, go back and read it because there's sort of an interesting sidebar conversation going at the same time, which I think is a good side effect of this. Sorry, with that, probably everybody forgot your question, Dana. Where can we find you? And what's the one piece of takeaway? And Andrew, I want you to answer this too. Okay. I'll go first because it's easy. I don't have any social media, so you can't find me anywhere. Good luck. Congrats. Congratulations, <laughs> uh, by the way. Thanks. Um, and then, uh, what's the second part? Uh, things, I don't I just, I, I need to get more out and, and talk. I think most knowledge is shared between professionals, not in books. Um, so a lot of the things that I've learned on my path to, to deploying our new solution to doing something like that is talking to other professionals in the industry that know more. And I, I definitely know that uh, I will be more in the general talk, the general channel, having talks to people just to uh, see what I can do in my infrastructure. Cool. All right, I guess I'll go next. Russ White, rule11.tech, the hedge, history of networking, LinkedIn. I don't do Facebook and I don't, don't do anything personal on uh, on social media at all. Everything for me, social media is professional. Uh, it comes from working at LinkedIn and in the hyperscale industry. Once you've worked in the sausage factory, you probably don't like sausage very much anymore. 
That's just oh, you like it, it even more. <laughs> yeah. So that's just the way it works. So final takeaway, you know, think about your trade-offs, think about your system level stuff and think about simplicity and really focus in on the simplicity issues and the complexity issues, because I think that's what we're missing today in our, in the IT world is we're really missing that piece of it. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, I'm only on LinkedIn, and my LinkedIn is at least three years off date. So that's the only place you go find me online. Um, I always think about blogging, but then things like family and, and pandemic hits, and then you, all your well-best plans are all laid a Um My one takeaway from me is always plan. Um, too many times, I think engineers everywhere are always forced to do things on the fly and not enough time spent planning. So there's a luxury and one of those things that we have to do things right. It's, it's one of those old things, you know, measure, measure, measure twice, cut once, you know, not cut twice, measure once. So. Good. All right. Um, as for me, um, the only places I tend to ramble are on the packet pusher Slack channel. I do not, I have Twitter accounts, I have accounts on everything, but I don't tend to do social media. I have this uh, mixed antipathy for it as far as uh, the, the narcissistic elements of it keep me from, from doing too much there. Um, but I'm in the NVIP, thanks to Dana's invitation. So, I mean, I'll chat there with folks. I, I tend to chat with the community. I'm not for the public, I mean, who cares what I, what I have to say about anything. Um, but uh, final takeaway, I think Russ says it very well as far as simplicity. S simplicity is hard, right? That's, uh, there's, I forget who was famous for saying that, but simple is hard. Um, and the other thing I would say is with respect to this whole, you know, should you DIY or DDI, one of the elements I would say is think about what is your time worth, right? The one thing none of us get any more of is time. So is this where you want to focus your time? If, if this is your business, if your whole business is doing stuff with DNS and, and you know you have some sort of business that this is integral to your special secret sauce, sure. Um, otherwise, and if you can't afford it, of course, if you're in situations like it used to be in, you may not have a choice. But otherwise, really focus on, and, and don't just pay, to the, uh, pay attention to the obvious, right? Some people look at these appliances and say, wow, they're expensive. Look further. Look at how much manpower it's going to take. Look at also also the flexibility. We discussed that earlier that you want to have that, you know, it, less people may be needed for a DDI. If you, if you buy an appliance and you set up this infrastructure, it'll be less to manage it, but you also expand the ca capability of others to get in on it. And I, we never touched on some of this stuff, but role-based access control, um, the ability of organizations to be able to, I don't know whether Uber does it or not, but you have places where you can say, okay, fine, you guys want to manage this little corner of your IP address management, your DNS, we can hand that off to you. Now, I don't have to worry about it, right? You, you step away from the, the grunt work, the stuff that, as, as Ryan was saying, it's like, you know, being able to put your brain where you want to focus your real time. And I, I, that's all I can say is, you know, what is your time worth? Focus on, on that element and the simplicity side of it, and odds are you'll, you'll land where you need to. All right, and I'm available on Network VIP Slack, uh, and uh, I'm on Twitter at a workin. Um, but uh, but yeah, social media is tough these days, especially given the polarization in politics and everything else that's going on. It's it's sometimes conversations that that uh, that you, you get a very peculiar view of uh, on social media. So I'm probably on Slack more than uh, social media not probably definitely way more look my, my my take home is is you know sort of something that's that's uh it's constantly close to me i think i think people uh need to make decisions based on context and requirements and a broader system and i think that it's really important when we think about these sorts of questions uh to understand that that broader system perspective um, so that that optimization can be can be done to meet higher level requirements. Um, yeah, the lower level requirements are critical, but if you're only looking at those lower level requirements, then yes, you can you can roll out. You know, you, you can you can accomplish these same things in different ways. The second you start looking at the broader system, I think those requirements are what probably guides a lot of these decisions more. And uh, it's tough for people to do that because a lot of people just, you know, have their blinders on. This is their area of focus. And, uh, and you know, even somebody was talking, uh, Russ, you mentioned the sort of knowledge gap between, let's say, the DNS guys and the networking guys. 
you know, we have we have customers where like they go to implement, um, I don't know, like, uh, you know, they, they want to expose DNS on a, any cast IP address and like, oh, well, that means we're going to deal with the network guys, you know, let's let's leave that to next year. So in some cases, they're not even working well together, you know, let alone trying to optimize the system. And, and I think I think uh, I think with most things, it comes down to that sort of systems thinking. Uh, that's my last piece of advice. Superb. Well, thank you all very much. I hope everybody enjoyed this. I loved the conversation on the side. As I said before, uh, we definitely want more and more ideas. Um, and uh, I think it's fantastic that this community is starting to thrive. So thank you all for participating. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us.